In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the Feast of St. Philomena. We honor and pray to her for her help to fight this battle, to get to heaven, to escape the fires of hell. And the history of the Church, as Cardinal Newman once said, who was an Anglican himself and became a Catholic, he said, when any, any Protestant or anyone studies history honestly, they cease to be Protestant, they cease to be a heretic. Because all history is in favor of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, her heroic saints, her heroic triumphs over paganism and immorality and darkness, and even, even the, the taming of war. Even the taming of war. It was the monks who brought about the truce of God to calm down the barbarians who would over-abuse their might and power to bring about the great Catholic knight. The knight who would fight for the cause of the Holy Catholic Church against the infidels, the Muslims, and defend Christendom against the onslaughts of the Muslims who have no principles and morals and worship Satan. Allah is Satan. Muhammad is damned. He's a false prophet. And we may die for professing that someday. If you said that in the middle of Saudi Arabia, you definitely would die a martyr. So, uh, and the invasions of the Muslims in Europe right now, and slowly leaking into the United States in the name of migration, and immigration, and, and uh, homelessness. They're anything but old ladies and little kids. They're tough young soldiers coming in. And when they declare the jihad, it'll be another repeat of, of the, why the popes called the Crusades. Because they were slaughtering many Catholic people, children, men, women, when they were going to the Holy Land to make pilgrimages by the thousands. And the Muslims were just massacring these people and then invading villages and cities and tearing down the churches, burning them on fire, etc., etc., etc. The record of Muslims, as usual, down history. So, the, the great Reconquista that we have been talking about, studying of Spain, which began with Palaio in 722, ended with the great victory of Granada in 1492, the Blessed Mother open to Spain since they, since they were so devoted to our Blessed Mother especially. God gave to Spain the mission to convert the North and South America. So the missionaries went and Christopher Columbus planted the cross on San Salvador and then he made several trips and the Queen Isabella backed him, financed him and, the, and then more and more missionaries came. By the time of St. Ignatius, in the, in the mid-early 1500s, he would say to St. Francis Xavier, who was studying to be a lawyer, had already great plans, and he said to, he said to him, Francis, what does it matter if you gain the whole world and suffer the loss of your soul? And those words of Christ penetrated the heart of St. Francis Xavier, converted him. He abandoned the secular career, gave his life to be a priest, and would die on the shores of Japan after converting much of India, converting much of Japan. He would die on the beach of Japan, looking at China with the desire and longing to bring China to the Catholic faith. So God would raise up through the Jesuits a whole army of real tough saints, missionaries, who were there with the right spirit to convert souls to Christ. And Queen Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, they will make a proclamation on the treatment of Indians. This is very important because the modern historians love to bash Spain to love, they loved to bash the Inquisition, which was a glorious and great thing. They loved to bash anything to do with the, the work of these missionaries. And they even go so far as to say, with the gentle and man of faith that's, that Father Sarah was, that he was here to make uh, slaves of the Indians. 
So this proclamation, I won't read the entire thing, but it begins like the way our constitution of our country should begin. <clears throat> this, was, this was written in Medina del Campo in Spain, November 23rd, 1504. So right when the, the Spain and even Portugal are coming in to convert the Indians, <clears throat> the Portuguese were famous for their abuse for making, starting to make slaves of the Indians. And that was condemned by the king and queen. They didn't want that. But it's very important. Um, out of Washington, out of Washington comes the orders to send troops into Iraq or Saudi Arabia or, or Afghanistan. Beside the point whether it's a just or unjust war. But when Washington makes that decision, the troops go in. Now some troops abuse their their, some of the soldiers abused their, their right to fight. And some of them really abused children, really abused men. And there were some soldiers, maybe I shouldn't say this from the pulpit, but uh, with ladies here, but some soldiers uh, used a dead, a dead Muslim as a urinal. And that, these, this behavior is, is, is an abuse. And even in the police academy, even in any police force, even in any branch, Army, Marines, Navies, Navy SEALs, Rangers, there's always soldiers that abuse what they're supposed to stand for. That happens all the time. So when there's some abuse from some Portuguese <coughs> idiots or some Spanish idiots, it doesn't mean Spain was out to make slaves of the Indians. That means there were just a few idiots who abused what was their purpose to be there for. So this was the proclamation by Queen Isabella with full authority of Spain that they were to, here I'll take the words here, in the name of the most, the, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and then he lists da 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 da. At the time when the islands and the firm land of the ocean sea, discovered and to be discovered, were given to us by the Holy Apostolic See, so the Pope gave to Spain the, the mission to convert it. It was our main intention when we asked this from Pope Alexander VI of good memory who gra gave us this grant to try to induce to and bring the peoples from there and to convert them to our holy Catholic faith. That was the purpose. Convert these pagans to our Lord Jesus Christ and to send to their said islands and firm land prelates, bishops, and religious and clergy and other learned and God-fearing persons to teach its citizens and dwellers the holy Catholic faith and to teach and instruct them in good morals and to do it with great diligence in accordance to the more extensive letters by which this grant was given. Therefore I ask the King, my Lord, with great affection and entrust and command to this princess, my daughter, and to the prince, my, her husband, that they thus act and fulfill it. And da, da 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 And then it says also, it ends, they are not to be treated as slaves and abused. And that was a solemn proclamation which was respected by the best of the Spaniard conquistadores and of course by the Franciscan priests <coughs> and the Jesuits. <coughs> now in South America, especially in Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, and Chile, the Jesuits would go down <clears throat> and they did tremendous work, tremendous work. Today there stands massive churches. In New Mexico you're going to see ruins of some of these churches. But in, in uh, South America they're still standing. Massive churches and massive cities that the Jesuits, they were called the Reductions. And the Reductions was basically a Catholic city where the Indians could come learn the faith, be baptized, and live around there. Like the medieval monasteries, people moved to live around the monastery. And then they plowed, plowed their fields, raised their animals, raised their families. And that was, that's what <clears throat> developed into what was the Catholic cities in Europe. Most of the Catholic cities throughout Europe were first begun around monasteries. So that's kind of what the Jesuits were doing in the South America and planned to do in North America. <clears throat> the Freemasons, of course, you cannot study history 
without mentioning the dark side. It would not be honest. Peter, wake up. It would not be honest. So the Freemasons, they already, they already saw what was going on. The, the Europe had fallen to Protestant heresy by Martin Luther in 1517, and Spain was conquering and bringing the faith to the whole new world, North and South America. So the Freemasons were hard at work, and they would succeed to have the Jesuit order suppressed through a weak pope. And this suppression, twice it would be suppressed, and they would, uh, the Jesuits would have to pull out of their missionary work in South America. This was a disaster for many, many souls. A disaster, but a triumph for Freemasonry. And the Freemasons all over the world by the 16-1700s, certainly after the French Revolution, they were setting fires everywhere. Their, their, their whole revolution was to destroy monarchy and in the name of democracy bring about the, the, the rights of man, that is man over God. And all, everyone's private opinion and everyone's private belief over the true religion. And they call it freedom of conscience and freedom to believe what you want. But this has been condemned many times by our Lord, by the Holy Catholic Church. We are not free to believe in error and heresy. We are not free to do that. If you want, no one's going to stop you. But you don't have the right to believe error and heresy. And the state has to protect the true religion. And what you got with Spain is an, an excellent example of what a Catholic state is about. It has to support the true religion and profess the true religion. Because the state, President Trump, when he dies, who's he going to be judged by? Muhammad? No, he's in hell. Luther? He's also a priest burning in hell, as a nun saw. <clears throat> a holy nun saw. Joseph Smith, the, the crack case, he's, he's dust and bones. He's, he's going to be judged himself. So any Buddha, Buddha is, is a phony belief. So all these false religions, including Pre and President Trump himself, when all these people die, they're coming before our Lord Jesus Christ. When we die, we come before our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the true God. There is no other. So President Trump and Obama and all of them will be judged for their presidency by our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the Catholic state, the, the presidents or the leaders or the kings and queens, they also fear God. They fear His judgment. So they, they know they've got to save their soul and profess the true religion. That's part of the glory of Catholic Spain. Now, <clears throat> we were on the island of Coronado, and you need to, you need to know that many of these great, great, these, these great conquistadores who came from Spain, they were the first to introduce to the whole new world horses, dogs, and many new vegetation and crops. Corn was introduced, uh, was, uh, was, was known here and was introduced back to Spain. The gold of South America the, was used, many of it was, much of it was imported back to Spain and you can see in Toledo almost a life-size golden monstrance to hold Christ the King. It's stable, so the priest has to actually <laughs> climb a staircase to put the sacred host in the monstrance for adoration. But all of that is made from the gold from South America. And of course, South America was abundant with gold, and the Aztecs were always dressed in gold. But here, the, listen to this account. <clears throat> the, the Viceroy of Mexico chose Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, another Catholic conquistador, to head up the exploration and conquest of, south, of the Southwest. Coronado was born in Salamanca, and studied at his university before going to Mexico, where he was named governor of Nueva Galicia. He prepares for his expedition over the period of several months, investing a substantial amount of money in it. Finally, in February, he leaves from Compostela, northern, northwest of Spain, with 336 soldiers and settlers, 100 native Mexican Christians, 552 horses, 
So Spain was the first to bring the horse to this side of the world. 600 mules, 5,000 sheep, and 500 cows, goats, and pigs. With him he also takes the Franciscan fathers, Father Marcos Niza, Father Juan de Padilla. Father Juan de Padilla will be the first martyr in the United States. In 1542 he'll be killed by the Indians in Kansas. Uh, there's a cross erected there where Father Juan de Padilla was was martyred and his body is in San Agostino south of Albuquerque. We will be kneeling on his tomb where he's buried and he's incorrupt also but they have him buried deep. <clears throat> Father Antonio Castilla Blanco, Father Juan Escolana and Father Luis de Ubeda. They entered throughout the southeastern Arizona and on Ju July 7th, so we are in we are in the southeastern part of Arizona. So we're going to see one of the missions that most likely Father that this Coronado went to Mass in. We're going to see that today, San Jose. They go as far as the Coronado, Colorado River, which they call the River Tizon. And for the first time, the eyes of the Europeans behold the grandeur of the Grand Canyon. So long before this is 15, this is 1540, all right? This is almost 300 years before the Mayflower landed on the Plymouth Rock. And the Catholic Indians used to say, it's too bad that the Plymouth Rock didn't land on the Mayflower to sink at that ship. Because the Puritans just brought a disaster for the United States, the, the Protestant heresy. But... 300 years before the Mayflower arrived, you've got Catholic priests, Catholic court, uh, conquistadors looking down the Grand Canyon for the first time. So remember that when we see the Grand Canyon in a couple of weeks. Another group with Father Padilla explores the Northeast, while Coronado himself in October reaches the Rio Grande near Bernadillo, and so forth and so forth. So they're here to bring the Catholic faith and then we cannot fail to mention one of the greatest heroes of all time, Hernan Cortez. You say that name, liberals start shaking and passing out. They hate that, that man. Why? Because he was just so Catholic. He brought the Blessed Virgin Mary and he told his soldiers, burn the ships. When they arrived from Spain on the coast of Veracruz, which is the eastern side of Mexico, on the Gulf of Mexico, told his shoulders, his soldiers, if you got shaky knees, I'll solve that problem. Burn the ships. <laughs> so there was no more going home. It would be like blowing up the van and the trailer. So we're here to stay, our hitchhike home, our swim home for their case. So the soldiers realized this is, we're here to convert Mexico and this is serious business. So they consecrated the whole mission to our Blessed Mother. Cortez with his troops, they made their way through Mexico and many of the tribes of Mexico, the Indian tribes who are on the outskirts of Mexico City, <coughs> they were welcoming the missionaries and Cortez. They came with the cross and there was an old prophecy because St. Thomas the Apostle there's no doubt, as Mary of Agreda says this as well, he bilocated from Jerusalem to South America to preach the Catholic faith. And he was not well received by those people at the time. So there was a prophecy that was passed down even to Montezuma, the leader of Mexico and the head of the Aztec Empire, that they waited, that they knew someday there would come men in robes with beards and bringing the cross. And this was it. Cortez came with the cross and the Franciscan priest with him. This is 1519. This is hardly 50 years before Our Lady of Guadalupe. She's going to step in also and do some tremendous damage to Satanism and Satan's kingdom. So Cortez, what's going to happen is he's going to realize the, these, these Indian tribes in Mexico, they are willing to 
changed and abandoned their ugly religion. They're sick of it. The cities stink with dead bodies. Because everywhere through Mexico they're offering and ripping out hearts to the God of the sun and the God of the moon. They're sick of it. So the best of these people welcome gladly the religion that comes foretold in their ancient prophecy, but also the religion that teaches true charity, the love of the poor, to have compassion on the dying and the old and the sick. This, this is, it's obviously this is good. And Christ taught this and lived this, and to bring the true mass and the true sacraments to wash away sin on the soul and give us the life of grace. So the Indians on the outskirts, they welcome Cortez and his men. And they want to convert, many of them. But they all fear the Aztecs. And as they make their way, Cortez being a soldier, he's gathering all the strategy and information. And as he comes to the city of uh, Mexico City, it's a massive work of engineering. It's a city built on a huge, gigantic lake, <clears throat> which the lake is gone now. But it was built on a huge lake, kind of like Venice with waterways instead of streets. They would go on canoe down through streets. It was a massive work of engineering. And the Aztecs were not, you know, just barbarians eating dirt, eating uh, worms out of the dirt <clears throat> and dragging their knuckles. They were very intelligent people. And they knew the constellations of the stars. And they had advanced for, you know, advanced, very, very advanced engineering in their time, 1530s. <clears throat> so what happens? Long story short, Cortez, his goal is take the city for the Blessed Virgin Mary. He will befriend Montezuma. Montezuma, he knows the prophecy also, and he realizes the, this must be the fulfillment. And the whole, there's a contingent of Aztecs that hate what they see, and long story short, they go to war. And what will happen is Cortez with his 300 men will take a city of several million. That's what's going to happen by the power of our Blessed Mother. And he will succeed to put the statue of Our Lady on top of the Pyramid of the Sun, the biggest of the statues. And since then, on top of that pyramid where it was built, was built the Basilica of the Catholic Basilica of Mexico City. In 1535, you've got the first Catholic University. A hundred years before Harvard, 250 years before Yale. Before any Protestant universities take root in the United States, there's already Catholic universities. And these, it's so well of a university, they're sending professors to Europe to teach from Mexico. And they're teaching the sound philosophy of, of Aristotle and St. Thomas, and the Catholic doctrine and teaching. So, um, in 1519, 1514, Cortez arrives. 1519, he takes the city. And in 1531, the Blessed Virgin Mary appears right in the middle of the human sacrifices. Because they can't exterminate it all overnight. And many, many Indians are converting, but it's not... It's not, it's like right now with Catholic tradition, it's not mass crowds converting, as will happen with Our Lady's victory. It's trickles. So the, the Franciscan priests are laboring very hard to convert these people. And then Juan Diego, he's chosen by Our Lady. And again, a very long story made short. Our Lady appears to him on the hill. She says, my little Juanito, which is like my dear little John, Johnny. Don't you know I'm your mother? And I want, and I, and don't you have any worries? Your uncle will be better. And don't, don't, don't be worried. You are in my mantle and I hold you in my arms like a mother holds her child. So she says these tender words to all the people of North and South America. And then again, she works this miracle of this image, which will be imprinted on his tilma. He must have been pretty tall, because the tilma was, tilma was pretty tall. But the tilma was a huge, like a big uh, poncho. Kind of like a poncho. It was made from that cactus material that I showed you, Maguey. And it shouldn't last longer than 20 years. 
The one in Mexico City miraculously has, is still supple. Pope John Paul II, when he held it, uh, of course, not that he was a saint, but when he held it, it was supple. He asked to hold it, and he, he fell into tears holding that image. Hopefully she saved him when he died from hell. But uh, this tilma, when the Aztecs saw that tilma and the image of Our Lady on it, they realized this has to be from the true religion. Why? One, they know the constellations of the stars. They, they can read the constellations of the stars on her mantle. And on her head is the Corona Borealis. On her heart is the constellation of Virgo. On her stomach, because she's with child, of the child Jesus. And this is uh, December the 12th, so it's during Advent. And the, the constellation of Leo is on her womb, where Jesus Christ is. They, read, they can read all the symbolism on her mantle. And now today, in the last 50 years, technology has picked up in the eyes of the Virgin Mary. Her eyes reflect like an actual human eyeball reflects. There's 13 people reflected in her eyeball. And, and then uh, NASA even put it through a scanner, and they just said, it's inexplicable. It cannot be explained. Because the colors are not painted on or soaked into the fibers. It's like they're floating on it. And the colors are made of pigment unidentifiable to anything on Earth. Plants, dyes, anything. So, it is truly miraculous, this image. But what did the Aztecs read? They saw, this is the, a woman who's a mother, she's burying a child, and this child is God. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Because on her mantle, you can't see it here, is a flower that the Aztecs saw was a symbol of the center of the universe. It's a four-petaled flower. All the other flowers have more than four petals. So when the Aztecs saw that, they saw she's a mother of some great king. But she's not a god, because her head is bowed to someone higher. And her hands are folded into, in reverence to somebody higher, of course, to God. But she's also greater than the sun god that they tore human hearts to because she's blocking the sunlight and behind her is the sun rays. And she's also greater than the moon god because she's standing on him. So when they read this, there's 80 million conversions. 80 million conversions. The Franciscan bishops, priests, and the missionaries are day and night baptizing. Their arms are falling off with all the baptisms. And it's mass conversions. Mexico becomes a real Catholic country. And Satan knew this. And that's why he will establish in the north the goddess of liberty, the Statue of Liberty, which will be a gift by the Freemasons in France to the Freemasons in the United States, who in Washington. And that Statue of Liberty has her back towards Our Lady Guadalupe. So we got to pick our choice. Do we want the, the Goddess of Liberty or the true mother of the true liberty? And maybe someday when the U.S. becomes Catholic, we can uh, do a little engineering on that Statue of Liberty and put the child Jesus in her arms and fix her up a bit to be the true mother of God. But. They're, those are the two ideals at war, the Freemasonry and Satanism, the Judeo-Masonry, which will wage war against the Mother of God. That's the war of the United States. And the Catholic missionaries' work was aborted by the Freemasonic unjust conquest and taking, stealing of the lands, or bargaining the lands. That's another story. So. In Mexico, fast forward to its long history, it's a long history of battles with the Freemasonry. But by the time of the Cristeros in 1926, when Callez come to power, he passed laws that really forbade saying adios, wearing any miraculous medals, a miraculous image of Our Lady, the miraculous medal, where praying the rosary in public was banned, Catholic schools were closed down, and um, eventually it came to violence. And he himself said, Kaya said, we will 
it's, this is a psychological warfare. Now think about the modern education today in the colleges and in the schools. He said, this is a psychological warfare. We will, we will aim to get the youth. We're going to target the youth and get them for tomorrow. So that's why he banished, the Freemasons banished as much as they could the Catholic religion. And in doing this, the Cristeros rose up. And they said, We've, we will die rather than seeing our Catholic faith um, crushed. So the, hero, the heroism of these Cristeros cannot be praised enough. But it didn't just end in 1929. There, was a, there were three parts to the Cristero Crusade. The first part is 1926 to 1929. And the second part was a little of what's much rougher because the clergy by then didn't support the Cristeros. But there were martyrs of that period, like Father Pedro de Maldonado, who would be beaten to death carrying the Blessed Sacrament to a sick person. The Freemasons surrounded him. They, would, they tried to get the Holy Eucharist out of his hand. This is 1937. The same year they tried to bomb the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. But it was miraculously kept intact. The whole altar was smashed. The crucifix was bent. But the tilma was miraculously preserved. So when they tried to take the host out of Father Maldonado's hand, he wouldn't open his hand. So they dragged him up to the third story of a big building, hung him outside the window by his legs, and smashed his face, his whole body, into the rock wall of the building. So there was all splashed in blood. And he still would not open his hand, and they beat him with butts of their guns until he died. And even after he died, his hand would not open and they had to call the bishop to come in and when the bishop arrived he took the blessed sacrament his hand open but when that blood on the wall the freemasons tried to wash it off because people started coming to soak their handkerchiefs in it for because he's a martyr for the faith he was a he real hero the freemasons washed it hosed it down and the next day the blood was on there again and they wash it down again. And the third day was still appearing, the blood. So they ended up knocking down the building. And to show you the hatred of the Freemasons, just like they did in Spain, they surrounded the statue of our Lord Jesus Christ the King, and they executed him with drum roll and everything. Ready, aim, fire. They shot the statue of Christ the King, which was often throughout Mexico and they tore it down with cables and there's photographs of that so the Cristeros many of them died heroic a seven year old boy he was playing marbles in the street and there was a, a priest who kept that marble as a relic and this little boy was they had a big procession in the street praying the rosary and the, the federales came with the hoses and uh, dispersed the procession and shot bullets into it as well and the little boy had on his, um, his name was Juan, he had on his chest, Viva Cristo Rey. So the police guard walked up to him and said, kid, take that off. And the little Juan said, no, and he ran home. The police followed him to his house, and they knocked at the door, and his father answered the door, and said, what do you want? Well, your boy is wearing something outlawed by the law. So the little boy, the dad called his boy, hey Juan, come here. This police officer wants you to take that off. And the boy said, well, Dad, you always told us we have to be ready to die for Christ the King. So the officer took his double barrel rifle to the boy's head and he said, boy, take that off. And little Juan said, Viva Cristo Rey. And he shot his head blown off right in front of his family. That's just one little example. A 12 year old boy was killed, 14 year old boy, a 16-year-old boy was, he ran out of ammo, he was overtaken by the Federalis. The 16-year-old boy, they tried to bribe him to fight for the, with the Freemasons. He refused, and he would just answer, Viva Cristo Rey, I fight for Christ the King. So they, one of the guards took his tongue and cut it out. 
So it was just blood spilling out of his mouth. So he made the sign of the cross. And that infuriated the guards. So they cut off his right hand. And with his bloody stump, he made the sign of the cross. And that got them so angry, they just shot him riddled with bullets. 16 year old, dying for the faith. And then many heroic men, men and boys, and women too, with the St. John of Arc Brigade, they did immense work. Some heroic battles, heroic victories, and they were winning the war. The Cristeros were winning the war. And they would go to mass before every battle. They had a whole code of chivalry. And if one guy was caught raping or abusing any girl, they were to be executed. So one guy was actually caught with the girl, but he, he didn't do anything, but it was against the code. And the general, I think it was Dionisio Ochoa, he said, I have, to, I have to kill you. So the guy said, look, don't let my friends execute me, let my enemies. Put me on the horse, tie my hands, and let my enemies shoot me. And that's what they did. They sent him into the enemy ranks and they shot him. Dionisio was one of the uh, uh, great generals. As they were passing through one night, the, the Cristeros were sleeping. And Dionisio had a dream that Our Lady appeared to him and said, you got to get out of here, the enemies are coming through within an hour. So he woke up and uh, his, his right hand and the hand man, his lieutenant said, yeah, I had the same dream. And the, another soldier woke up and said, I had the same dream. So they all woke up and they all said, look, we all had the same dream. That's a clear message. Let's get out of here. And sure enough, they cleared out and within an hour, the Freemasons came through. They would have been massacred in their sleep. And uh, just many thousands of his, his just heroic stories and uh, victories. And, and the shout of the Cristeros was Viva Cristo Rey, of course. The shout of the Federales was Viva Satana. Long live Satan. And the Cristeros, their, their fight, their zeal and their spirit was so fired up. There was one battle where they shouted right before battle, Viva, Cristo Rey, the whole shout. And the, the general on the Federales side fell off his horse, died of a heart attack from fear, wet in his pants. And so another uh, soldier was uh, he ran out of ammo. He didn't want his gun to be taken and used by the enemy. He broke it on the rocks in half, took whatever the pieces there were, held it up in the form of a cross, and was mauled over by the cavalry and shot, shouting, Viva Cristo Rey. And um, <coughs> one of the first Cristeros was Manuel, Manuel Bonilla. He was a 17-year-old boy. He was the, one of the first Cristeros to round up boys to help in the fight. He was captured with a 27-year-old Joaquin de Silva. They were taken to execution. And the Joaquin said to Manuel, Manuel, we're going to come before God very soon. Take off your hat. So they were offered blindfold. They refused blindfold, and both of them um, uh, Manu Manuel was sh no, Joachim was shot first, Manuel was shot second, and while he, he shouted Viva Cristo Rey, Viva the Virgin, he was shot and he died before saying De Guadalupe. And just to show you some of these mothers, they were not, the, you know, these palm olive commercial dishwashing detergent type of mothers who don't want any harm to their son, lest he scratch himself or get a bruise, God forbid. These mothers, these mothers were Catholic, and uh, they, they sent their boys, you gotta help, you gotta help the Cristeros. Many of them were totally supportive, and one mother sent four of her sons. Now in a war, you usually don't do that, because they lose them all, but she sent them all, you go fight for Christ the King, Our Lady of Guadalupe. They weren't fighting for the right to profess my beliefs. That is not true. That is a Masonic principle. They were fighting for the true religion and Christ the King. So this mother, the two of her boys were shot and the commander had to come and tell the mother. And the mother said, wait, I gave four of my sons to Our Lady Guadalupe. 
She didn't take all of them. She didn't take all of them. She, she wanted all of them to die martyrs. So another one, the mother of Anacleto Gonzalez Flores, who was a great saint. He was the one with the beard that was stabbed through and tortured. They should cut off his fingers. And his wife, there's a photograph of his wife and children around his dead body. And it was to his tomb that little Jose, at age 12, walked to his tomb in the cathedral of Guadalajara and prayed before his bones, his body, for the grace to die a martyr. And he did receive that grace. So Anacleto, when his brother, his brother and some of the other Cristeros were carrying his body to his mother, to her little house, she saw the, the procession coming towards the house. She came out in the street, in the road, and she said to Anacleto's brother, she said to him, I forgot what his name was. She says, my son, you need to be better. Because Anacleto won the crown of martyrdom. You didn't. You need to be better and love Our Lady more. So this is the kind of caliber these women were. And these men who, <clears throat> remember, we, we get hot just walking a little bit in this desert sun. But they're fighting all day. They're spending nights camping out. They have to kill bulls and foxes and possums, whatever they can grab to eat. And drink, finding water wherever they could. This was the conditions. And the priests were saying mass for the Cristeros out in the, certainly in Colima, in the volcano regions. They were saying mass for them. And there were a few good bishops, such as Bishop Orozco, who was saying mass for these Cristeros. So one of the cardinals in Rome, Gaspari, who was uh, not so great, he wrote to Bishop Orozco and said, what are you doing lowering yourself, living among these filthy peasants? And Bishop Orozco wrote back and he said, your eminence, if you saw the faith of these Cristeros, you would, it would remind you of the faith of the early Catholics in Rome, who went to the Colosseum bravely <coughs> to death. <coughs> So, um, so, 1929, what really happened? Pope Pius XI, he wrote two encyclicals condemning the, the action of the Freemasons in Mexico. He praised the martyrs. In 1929, the liberal bishops of Mexico tried, persuaded the Pope that this was useless bloodshed, that they were losing the war. And so the Pope gave orders to, to lay down their weapons. All the Catholics throughout Mexico, the Cristeros, obeyed. And many of them knew this is wrong. They knew they could not trust the Freemasons. The Freemasons were putting out a hand to shape on an agreement and a peace treaty. And th those good Catholics of Mexico, they knew you do not make peace with Freemasonry, ever. And they were right. And the Pope misinformed, he regretted his decision. He regretted it later. And uh, anyway, our lady, that's, so what happened? June 21st, 1929, all the, all the Cristeros in the town squares, obeying their bishops, obeying the Pope, threw down their weapons in the town squares. The Freemasons waited and watched as the boys with their dads threw down their Winchester 3030s. And as soon as the last one was done, he just shot them all down. The principle is, as Archbishop Lefebvre always repeated, you never make peace with Freemasonry, you never make an agreement with those modernists who destroy the Catholic faith. This is what Bishop Follet forgot. And he's made peace with these enemies, and they're swallowing the SSPX nice and slow and slimy, into their belly. It's happening before our eyes. Just last year a priest had a wedding with a novice auto priest here in the bows, Father Skippy with his novice auto vestments and the society priest Father Vachon said the Tridentine Mass on the back altar with the table right in the middle behind him. So um, our fight is the same gentlemen. It's the same battle. 
the principles of Satan against Christ the King, the principles of Freemasonry, Judeo Masonic powers against Jesus Christ the King. Take your side, take your pick. Which one are you going to fight on? But I encourage you to fight with the truth. And listen, I'm going to close this here with some more great words of Archbishop Lefebvre, who, who is our light and our guide on this, in this phase of the war. 19, <clears throat> 1984. We are convinced of this. It is they who are wrong, who have changed course, who have broken with the tradition of the church, who have rushed into novelties, we are convinced of this. This is why we do not rejoin them and why we cannot work with them. We cannot collaborate with the people who depart from the spirit of the church, from the tradition of the church. I think that it is that outlook that should guide us in our present situation. Same as now. Don't go with Bishop Follet's compromise. And Bishop Williamson, sadly, his softness on the new mass instead of incantism. Uh, we can't go with that. Hold the line of Catholic tradition. Let us not deceive ourselves by believing that by these little breaking actions, meaning we'll give you the Latin Mass, we'll give you your traditional seminaries, that are given on the right and on the left in the excesses of the present situation, that we are seeing a complete return to tradition. That is not true. That is not true. They remain always liberal minds. It is always the liberals who rule Rome, and they remain liberal. There is no agreeing to these people. From the moment when we rally ourselves, this rallying or agreeing will be the acceptance of the liberal principles. We cannot do this. Even if certain appeasements are given us, certain satisfactions, certain recognitions, certain incarnations, which could even be offered to you eventually, so he's talking to his future priest, and Bishop Follet probably heard this also, which could be offered to you eventually, but as long as one is dealing with people who have made this agreement with the devil, agreement with liberal ideas, we cannot have any confidence. They will string us along little by little, they will try to catch us in their traps. As long as they have not let go of these false ideas. So, from my point of view, it is not a question of doing whatever one can. Those who would have a tendency to do, to want to accept that, that will end up by being recycled. December 13th, 1984, addressed to the priests of the French district. So they forgot this. Last quote. I know this is long, but this is, you're in the battle, boys, and you've got to know this. 1986, uh, in the church, there is no law or jurisdiction which can impose a Christian on a Christian to diminish his faith. All the faithful can and should resist whatever interferes with the faith. If they are faced with an order putting their faith in danger of corruption, there is an overriding duty to disobey. It is because we judge that our faith is endangered by the post-conciliar reforms and tendencies that we have the duty to disobey and keep the tradition. The greatest service, listen to this, because every man, his greatest honor is to do something good for his country, for his family, for his nation, and you have the chance to do something great for Holy Mother Church and the glory of Christ the King. Listen to this. The greatest service we can render to the church is to reject the reformed and liberal church. I am not of that religion. I do not accept that new religion. It is a liberal modernist religion. Christians are divided. Priests no longer know what to do. Either they obey blindly what their superiors impose on them and lose to some degree the faith, or they resist, but with the feeling of separating themselves from the Pope. Two religions confront each other. We are in a dramatic situation. It is, an, it is impossible to avoid a choice. So our choice, 
is refuse the, the Church of Vatican II and the new Mass and the new sacraments and the new Code of Canon Law and stay with what made saints and what the popes have always handed down with tradition and the 20 councils of the Church. So fight on and as one of these great martyrs said at his death when he was uh, arrested in, in uh, Mexico there was a, uh, a guy, one of the soldiers arrested he was taken to against the wall to be shot and he shouted Viva Cristo Rey he refused blindfold and everything and uh, one of the guards said we'll show you what your Cristo Rey can do stand up against the wall we're gonna blow you to bits so the guy shouted uh, Christ the King is stronger than all of you Viva Cristo Rey and he took off running and they, they started shot, shooting at him and they kept running and running and running and they never caught him and he ran all the way to the, the uh, camp of the Cristeros and, um, and you know was able to relay some of the enemy strategies to his camp so many many victories and holy deaths and great martyrs so let's pray to these martyrs of mexico the martyrs even on our own soil here in the united states pray to them for that spirit of martyrdom o, o mary conceived without sin o mary conceived without sin o mary conceived without sin, o mary conceived without sin. O mary conceived without sin. O the father the son holy ghost amen